Let's now kick off with a look at the markets over in Kenya. Of course, recapping on trade as it played out in yesterday's session where we had the NSE 20 share index inching up, but marginally so, as you can see there, rise on 0.1% coming through, taking the market to that index to just over 4,518 points. As a number of listed firms announced their interim and full year results, we had the top uh, three banks in Kenya reporting. Kenya Commercial Bank, which is the country's biggest bank by assets, Equity Bank, the country's biggest bank by customers and cooperative bank as well all three of them posting double digit percentage profit growth and that saw equity bank shares rise 1.8 percent to 28 shillings 25 while cooperative bank gained three percent to close at 13 shillings 75 uh, following those results announcements of course on the currency front the kenyan shilling rallied for a sixth straight session to touch its strongest level against the dollar so far this year as investors hoped that monday's elections would prove to be peaceful the shilling firmed as much as 0.8% on the day to 85 shillings 60 against the dollar. That was a level that was last reached on December the 27th but gave up some of those gains to close at about that 86 mark. The shilling now uh, overall rallying 2% in the past six sessions wiping out losses that were made earlier this year when importers stockpiled dollars before the vote. We've had traders saying that the correction overdone and that's why it's come back to about this 86 mark right now at 85.95 to the greenback. So that a broad look at the Kenyan markets picture. Let's get into some analysis of it. And that's with Anthony Kimani, who's a research analyst over at Genghis Capital. Thanks so much, Anthony, for joining us this morning. Well, as I've uh, been saying, we've been looking at the shilling and m much of the commentary has been how the shilling behaves after the vote will depend on the noise in the market. Uh, what's your assessment of the kind of noise levels we're looking at pre-election? Well, we are not expecting a lot of noise, so to speak. We are expecting that the shilling will be stable up to the election and after vote counting, probably with a more clear result, we will now seek direction from there. But for now and up to the election, we are not expecting a lot of activity on the shilling. Let's translate that through to the equity scene and what kind of performance you see coming through there because the NSE 20 has risen 9.2% this year so far and uh, being given the impetus by those strong earnings reports that have been coming through hard and fast. Uh, yes, uh, in terms of the equity market, what we saw at the beginning of the year was that the market rallied somewhat, but as we neared the election, we are seeing investors sort of take a wait and see approach towards the market. And we are expecting if the election will be peaceful, that we'll see the, the markets rally once again. Of course, I touched on the fact that we had the top three banks in Kenya reporting during the course of yesterday's session. At the end of that session, a couple of com companies coming through with their financials as well. BAT Kenya, one of them, posting a 6% jump in pre-tax profit for last year to 4.75 billion shillings. What did you make of the kind of results that they put on the table? Well, BAT's results were obviously as expected. Being a discretionary consumer good company, we always expect that the results would be as strong. I guess what was interesting to us was the fact that the dividend payout was almost 100%, signaling that probably that their growth prospects are, are it's sort of a mature company. And yeah, that was pretty interesting. We also saw some companies, the banks primarily, releasing results yesterday. and. One of the key takeaways there, all of them had double digits growth, as you mentioned. And if you look at a bank like Cooperative Bank, we saw it post profits of about 19% on the EPS. And all of them basically had wonderful results. Yeah, well, that has been the expectation that's been held by bulk of the Kenyan investment community. Overall, though, let's bring it back to BAT because uh, what stood out there was the fact that this is a company that managed to see lower operating costs. So run us through that and how BAT is managing to achieve it because it's resulted in operating profit rising 9%, Anthony. Uh, the, the, uh, the thing with BAT, I'd say, is you're increasing efficiencies and you are selling more towards 
Uh, their, their focus is no longer the Kenyan market per se, it's more towards the East African region. And we saw growth in some of these periphery countries in terms of the products that they sold there. So we are seeing a lot of cost containment in Kenya and sales growing in some of the countries like Southern Sudan, Uganda. Right, let's uh, shift focus then to uh, Kenya's Bamburi cement because it posted a 15% drop in pre-tax profit last year. So take us through that, what the market's made off the numbers that's, uh, that has come through there and what's been exerting pressure on this company specifically. Uh, Bamburi, Bamburi relies so much on their HEMA subsidiary, that is where, and that is in Uganda. And for, for them, HEMA is like their next growth frontier it sort of helps them access the markets in in brazil in sorry in congo uh, in congo and rwanda and what we saw last year happening in uganda was that the electricity subsidies were scrapped off this and we saw their operating costs jump by almost 70 percent and for a manufacturer who does cement you, you see that cost is very huge because majority of their costs, 40% are actually energy related. So when the subsidies were scrapped by the Ugandan government, uh, we saw that impact on their bottom line to record an EPS of about 12.17. Yeah, exactly. We've seen those uh, higher costs driving operating profit for this company down 14%. So really, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're putting it against the likes of BAT from a cost perspective, when it comes to that shilling front or uh, <laughs> the dividend front, uh, rather, we've had uh, a dividend declaration of 8 shillings 50 coming through. A slight increase, not as exciting, of course, as the dividend that BAT's put on the table. But how much incentive does that offer you, Anthony? Would you be buying in to Bamburi right now? Yes, Bamburi has primarily been a dividend stock. If you look at a cement manufacturer like Earth River Mining, for instance, the dividend payout has not been ha as huge because they are more, folk they are more growth oriented. But Bamburi has decided to sort of grow a few of its markets, primarily in, East, in Uganda. And what we are seeing, it's, it behaves more of like a mature company and the dividend payout is something that investors have come to sort of expect from the company and it wouldn't if it would have been lower that would have probably affected their share price but what you're seeing they had to sort of increase it so that the yield comes to something like four percent and previous yields have actually been around eight percent so to dividend investors, the yield is lower, but the commitment that the, by the fact that they have risen the dividend by 50 cents, that will sort of argue well with them, given the high, cha the highly challenging operating environment that they faced. So, Anthony, year. would you be a buyer of Bamburi Cement right now? No, I'd be holding the stock. I wouldn't be buying it per se, but. Yeah, if I had the stock, I'd probably be holding it. Okay, so hold on Bamburi Cement. How are you feeling about Mumia's sugar? Because that share price tumbled 13.4% uh, yesterday to 4 shillings 20. And that after it warned in Wednesday's session that its full year profits will fall by more than 25%. Yes, exactly. Uh, Mumia's sugar is an interesting case. So investors are looking at the stock and they are sort of negative by the they, are, they they have this negative sentiment by the fact that the the profits are about to drop by 25 percent and to compound on to that is that by 2014 there's the subsidies or the commercial subsidies will be scrapped and the market will sort of be opened for other sugar manufacturers in the east african region and we know that these sugar manufacturers actually manufacture their sugar at a much much lower cost more than Mumia Sugar does. And we are, investors are sort of holding back and waiting to see how Mumia Sugar will fare under the increased competition. And of course, Mumia's at a point had highlighted the fact that it would be exploring the energy space and contributing to the energy arena a little bit more aggressively. Anthony, what stride are they making in that regard? Uh, 
in terms of energy, the energy, if you look at it from a national grid perspective, their contribution is very minimal. I think it's below actually 1%, so it's not as huge. And they are relying on hydropower. And the hydropower, oh, sorry, uh, they are relying on burning their, bag their bagues or the, the product that is left after processing sugar. And if the, the, the business in terms of sugar processing is declining, then we are not going to see a lot on that front. We are not seeing the revenues, we don't think the revenues will be significantly shored up by their electricity generation. 